You are welcome to Country Studies. Today we are going to continue speaking about the United Kingdom. Lecture 14 for this week will be devoted to the mass media. Lecture 14 will cover the following questions. The press, the characteristics of the national press, radio and television, organization and style. There are several different types of mass media in the United Kingdom television, radio, newspapers, magazines and websites. The country also has a strong music industry. The United Kingdom has a diverse range of providers, the most prominent being the publicly owned public service broadcast, the British Broadcasting Corporation. Television was by far the most used platform for news consumption among all nations in the United Kingdom in 2020. With 75% of adults in England, Scotland and Wales using it for this purpose, the internet was also a popular choice followed by social media and radio. According to a 2020 survey, television was the leading platform for news consumption across the UK, with 75% of respondents from all nations stating that they used it to access the news. The same survey revealed that BBC One remained the most popular TV news channel in the United Kingdom that year, with an audience uh, reach of 75%. BBC One, which is part of television service portfolio of the British Broadcasting Corporation, has held the lion's share of TV news watching hours in the United Kingdom for over a decade. While television remains a leading news source among adults, younger audiences primarily turn to the internet for news consumption. According to a recent survey, almost 80% of the UK news consumers between the ages of 18 to 24 considered the internet their leading news platform. And as of 2020, roughly 70% of the United Kingdom population read or download news content online. Among those who got their news coverage from online sources, BBC News stood out as the leading online news brand accessed in the United Kingdom that year. Besides, British people are also reported to be the world's most dedicated home video users. But this doesn't mean that they have given up reading. They are the world's third biggest newspaper buyers. Only the Japanese and Swedes buy more. The United Kingdom possesses one of the most universally respected and widely read national presses. According to Brian McNear, 80% of adults regularly read at least one national daily newspaper and 75% read the Sunday edition. In addition, despite growing fears among many journalists about the consequences increased concentration of ownership and the growing ability of governments to spin the media, the British press remains one of the freest and most diverse in the world. Compared to the United States, where papers based in a few large cities exert the most influence, in Britain, the local and regional press takes a clear backseat to the London-based national press. The leading papers' access to a national market makes them among the best-selling newspapers in the world. The main titles in the national daily press appear in the mornings. Many local dailies appear in the evening. Newspaper publication is dominated by the national press, as we have already stated, which is an indication of the comparatively weakness of regional identity in Britain. Nearly 80% of all households buy a copy of one of the main national papers every day. There are more than 80 local regional daily papers, but the total circulation of all of them together is much less than the combined circulation of the national dailies. The only non-national papers with significant circulations are published in the evenings when they do not compete with the national papers which always appear in the mornings. Most local papers do not appear on Sundays, so on that the day the dominance of the national press is absolute. 
The Sunday papers are so called because that is the only day on which they appear. Some of them are sisters of a daily but employing separate editors and journalists. The morning newspaper is a British household institution, such as an important one that until the laws were relaxed in the early 1990s, news agents were the only shops that were allowed to open on Sundays. People could not be expected to do without their newspapers for even one day, especially a day when there was more free time to read them. The Sunday papers sell slightly more copies than the national dailies, and they are thicker. Some of them have six or more sections, making up a total of well over 200 pages. Another indication of the importance of the papers is the morning paper round. Most news agents organize these, and uh, more than half of the country's readers get their morning paper delivered to their door by a teenager who gets up at around half past five every day in order to earn a bit of extra pocket money. One of the characteristic features of the national press, which is partially the result of the commercial interests of its owners, is its shallowness. Few other countries, I mean European countries, have a popular press, which is so low. Some of the tabloids have almost given up even the pretense of dealing with serious matters. Apart from sport, their pages are full of little except stories about the private lives of famous people. Sometimes their stories are not articles at all. The desire to attract more readers at all costs has meant that in the late 20th century, even the broadsheets known as the quality papers in Britain can look rather popular when compared to equivalent quality papers in some other countries. They are still serious newspapers containing high quality articles whose Presentation of actual information is usually reliable, but even they now give a lot of coverage to news with a human interest angle when they have the opportunity. This emphasis on revealing the details of people's private lives has led to discussion about the possible need to restrict the freedom of the press. And this is because in behaving this way, the press has found itself in conflict with another British principle, which is as strongly felt as that of freedom of speech, the right to privacy. Many journalists now appear to spend their time trying to discover the most sensational secrets of well-known personalities or even of ordinary people who by chance find themselves connected with some newsworthy situations. Of course, Britain is not the only country where the press is controlled by large companies with the same single aim of making profits. So why is British press more frivolous? The answer may lie in the function of the British press for its readers. British adults never read comics. These publications, which consist entirely of picture stories, are read only by children. It would be embarrassing for an adult to be seen reading one. Adults who want to read something very simple, with plenty of pictures to help them, have almost nowhere to go but the national press. Most people do not use papers for serious news. For this, they turn to another source, broadcasting. Each of the national papers can be characterized as belonging to one of two distinct categories. The first, the quality papers or broadsheets cater for the better educated readers. And the second, the popular papers or tabloids sell to a much larger readership. They contact for less print than the broadsheets and for more pictures. They use larger headlines and write in a simple style of English while the broadsheets devote much space to politics and other serious news Tabloids concentrate on human interest stories, which often mean scandals. However, the broadsheets do not completely ignore scandal or any other aspect of public life. Both types of paper devote equal amounts of attention to sport. The difference between them is in the treatment of the topics they cover. 
and in which topics are given the most prominence. The reason that the quality newspapers are called broadsheets and the popular ones are called tabloids is because they are different shapes. The broadsheets are twice as large as the tabloids. It's a mystery why in Britain reading intelligent papers should need highly developed skills of paper folding. None of the big national newspapers belongs to a political party. However, each paper has an idea of what kind of readers it is appealing to and a fairly predictable political outlook. Each can therefore be seen, rather simplistically, as occupying a certain position on the right-left spectrum. As you can see, the right seems to be heavily overrepresented in the national press. This is not because such a large majority of British people hold right-wing viewers. It is partly because the press tends to be owned by conservative party supporters. In any case, a large number of readers are not very interested in the political coverage of a paper. They buy it for sport or the human interest stories or for some other reason. The way politics is represented in the national newspapers reflects the fact that the British political parties are essentially parliamentary organizations. Although different papers have different political outlooks, none of the large newspapers is an organ of political party. Many are often obviously in favor of the policies of this or that party, or even more obviously against the policies of another party, but none of them would even use we or us to refer to a certain party. If you go into any well-stocked news agents in Britain, you will not only find newspapers, you will also see rows and rows of magazines catering for almost every imaginable taste and specializing in almost every imaginable pastime. Among these publications, there are a few weeklies dealing with news and current affairs. Partly because the national press is so predictable, some of these periodicals manage to achieve a circulation of more than 100,000. The Economist is one of the same type as Time, Newsweek. Its analyses, however, are generally more thorough. It's fairly obviously right-wing in its views, but the writing is of very high quality. And that's why it has a reputation of being one of the best weeklies in the world. The New Statesman and Society is a left-wing equivalent of The Economist and is equally serious and well-written. Private Eye is a satirical magazine which makes fun of all parties and politicians and also makes fun of the mainstream press. It specializes in political scandal and, as a result, is forever defending itself and legal actions. The country's best-selling magazine is the Radio Times, which as well as listing all the television and radio programs for the coming week, contains some 50 pages of articles. The BBC, or the British Broadcasting Corporation, is a public service broadcaster headquartered at Broadcasting House in Westminster, London. It is the world's oldest national broadcaster and the largest broadcaster in the world by number of employees, employing over 22,000 staff in total, of whom more than 20,000 are in public sector broadcasting. The total number of BBC staff amounts to 35 thousand, including part-time, flexible and fixed contract staff. Just as the British Parliament has a reputation of being the mother of Parliament, so the BBC might be said to be the mother of information services. The British Broadcasting Corporation came into existence on the 1st of January 1927, and their mission is to enrich people's life to inform, educate, and entertain them wherever they are. These first occurred through the medium of radio broadcast to people in Britain. Then, in 1932, the BBC World Service was set up with a license to broadcast first to the Empire and then to other parts of the world. 
During the Second World War, it became identified with the principles of democracy and free speech. In this way, the BBC's fame became international. Today, the World Service still broadcasts around the globe in English and in several other languages. The BBC also runs five national radio stations inside Britain and several local ones. BBC Radio 1 began broadcasting in 1967. Devoted almost entirely to pop music, its birth was a signal that popular youth culture could not longer be ignored by the country's established institutions. In spite of recent competition from independent radio stations, it still has over 10 million listeners. Radio 2 broadcasts mainly light music and chat shows. Radio 3 is devoted to classical music, whereas Radio 4 broadcasts a variety of programs from plays and comedy shows to consumer advice programs. Radio 5 is largely given over to sport, coverage and news. In terms of the size of its audience, television has long since taken over from radio as the most significant form of broadcasting in Britain. Its independence from government interference is largely a matter of tacit agreement. There have been occasions when the government has successfully persuaded the BBC not to show something, but there have also been many occasions when the BBC has refused to bow to government pressure. Most recent cases have involved Northern Ireland. For a brief period starting in the late 1980s, the government broke with the Convention of Non-Interference and banned the transmission of interviews with members of outlawed organizations on television. The BBC's response was to make a mockery of this law by showing such interviews on the screen with an actor's voice dubbed over the moving mouth of the interviewee. There is no advertising on the BBC, but independent television, ITV, which started in 1954, gets its money from the advertisements it screens. It consists of a number of privately owned companies, each of which is responsible for programming in different parts of the country on the single channel given to it. In practice, these companies cannot afford to make all their own programs and so they generally share those they make. As a result, it is common for exactly the same program to be showing on the ITV channel throughout the country. When commercial television began, it was feared that advertisers would have too much control over programming and the new channel would exhibit all the worst features of tabloid journalism. The Labour Party in uh, opposition at the time of its introduction was absolutely against it. So were a number of conservative and liberal politicians. Over the years, however, these fears have proved to be unfounded. Commercial television in Britain has not developed the habit of showing programs sponsored by manufacturers. There has recently been some relaxation of this policy, but advertisers have never had the influence over programming that they have had in the USA. Although the advent of ITV didn't affect television coverage of news and current affairs, it did cause a change in the style and content of other programs shown on television. The amount of money that a television company can charge an advertiser depends on the expect expected number of viewers at the time when the advertisement is to be shown. Therefore, there was pressure on ITV from the start to make its output popular. In its early years, ITV captured nearly three quarters of the BBC audience. The BBC then responded by making its own programs equally accessible to a mass audience. Ever since then, there has been little significant difference in what is shown on the BBC and commercial television ITV. Both BBC and ITV show a wide variety of programs. They are in constant competition with each other to attract the largest audience. This is known as the ratings war. But they do not 
each try to show a more popular type of program than the other, they try instead to do the same type of program better. Of particular importance in the ratings war is the performance of the channel's various soap operas. The two most popular and long-running of these, which are shown at least twice a week, are not glamorous American productions showing rich and powerful people. But they are ITV's Coronation Street, which is set in a working-class area near Manchester, and BBC's East Enders, which is set in a working-class area of London. So it became obvious in the early 1960s that the popularity of soap operas and light entertainment shows meant that there was less room for programs which lived up to the original educational aims of television. Since 1982, Britain had had two channels, BBC Two and Channel Four, from ITV, which act as the main promoters of learning and culture. Both have been successful in presenting programs on serious and weighty topics, which are attractive to quite large audiences. So, we can say that television broadcasting in Britain has expanded to fill every part of every day of the week. One of the four channels never takes a break, and the others broadcasts from around 6 in the morning until after midnight. There are some comprehension questions for you to discuss, and uh, they should be answered in written form and sent to Google Classroom. Thank you for your interest in country studies, and stay tuned to our YouTube channel.